if it's a little too high or too low. So you're either looking at someone's forehead or you're looking at their chin. Um, what they did a few times was right at the end of the studio, they would put big tape marks. Um, so I could see, so I would look directly at that tape, which was directly looking into the eyes of my other uh, clone, uh, kind of like that. Some of the scenes, there was nothing next to me, that scene where I came in and I put my hand on my clone, it was nothing. I just, I just walked in and was like, so. And it just worked. We were lucky. That was my idea, to do that shot. And they said, Cliff, okay, it's very expensive. I said, we've got to do that shot. We gotta, I have to touch, touch myself. <laughs> I couldn't word it anywhere else, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and they said, look, that, cost, that shot's going to cost $35,000. You've got to do it right. You know? And we did it in one take. And I was just so happy with it because you've got to be careful because either you're going to go down like, into yourself or you know, you're going to be above yourself and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so it was very difficult, but a great uh, learning experience. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Another question here. Uh, hello to you all. Uh, nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Huh? Um, I, I just say it's my honor if I... It, to be a first poem to any of you. <laughs> oh, hello. Come a little closer. <laughs> I think you mean these two. Um, uh, my question is, um, if you could take one device away from Stargate, what would you choose? <laughs> I agree. The I, I love the hand device. Yeah, I think that's just a cool thing to have. For me, it, was, it would have been a Zat gun, to tell you the truth. I didn't get to hold a weapon. Uh, per se. Oh, well, yes, I did. I got the staff weapon in one of those episodes, in the Knox, I think. I don't know what it was. But I had a staff weapon. I would have preferred a Zat gun. I liked the phase shifting technology that allowed me to become invisible. I thought, that's very handy. I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have liked to have taken all the Jafar with me. <laughs> I, I've, I've actually got two questions. Um, how heavy were your costumes for the gold and um, your individual costumes? And when it came time to do the voice for the gold, were there any sort of awkward moments when you were trying to play a gold as opposed to a regular um, person? Sue so, Ann, your costume wasn't very heavy, was it? <laughs> No, that's because there was nothing to it. <laughs> and in fact, I was saying yesterday, I saw the original drawing, and it literally was a coat hanger that had been sort of turned into some kind of Barbarella-type bra, and then a thing that went down here, and then a whoop, up the um, butt floss kind of thing. So I was mightily relieved I wasn't wearing that. Um, so mine wasn't heavy, but it was exceptionally uncomfortable. Uh, I couldn't sit down in it. It was completely heavily, heavily boned down the sides. Um, and I had to have the other costume underneath, which used to dig into me, and the neck thing, and I couldn't sit down on set, so they used to give me a board, and I'd kind of be like, you know, <laughs> propped up against the wall, going, hi, morning, hello, yeah, time to work, okay. <laughs> um, and in terms of doing, uh, no, because what they do is they added all that in post-production, so when you're being the gold and your voice has to change, it was more a physical thing of, you know, with the eyes kind of looking down and, I think also with my character, because so much of her evilness was seduction, I didn't have any of that kind of stuff. I just had all the... <sighs> the um, snake head... I had several costumes. The two snake heads, this, actually it was two, because um, you saw it as one, but it was two. Uh, one was permanently open, and another one was hydraulically controlled to open and close. So anytime you see the thing opening and closing, it's the mechanical one. And anytime you see me just walking around with the snake head on, it's the rubberized open one. They both weighed about 60 pounds each. Yeah, they were heavy. The only uh, weight that I had to any of my costumes was the bodice piece that I wore in uh, Fair Game because it, had, it was encrusted with semi-precious stones and it was incredibly beautiful. So it was worth lugging around. I was absolutely fine with that. Yeah, my costumes were very heavy. Um, and also most of the time I had those 
huge boots above the knee, leather boots, things which were extremely hot. My costumes were very, very, very hot. And shooting in Vancouver in summertime, they switched the air conditioning off in the studios because of the sound. And it gets to like 100 degrees in the studio. And uh, you're just sweating underneath those. Um, the jacket I had for Continuum, the coats were beautiful, thick, thick leather. Uh, probably weighed about 20 pounds. That jacket was really heavy, yeah. All of my costumes were very heavy because they were all real leather and real metal. Nothing was fake. There wasn't plastic and, you know, fake leather plastic or PVC. Plastic would be hot, or, too. And, the, and yeah. the, the film lights are extremely hot. It's like standing right under a heater. So I had lots of air conditioning, though, built into my costume, so I was fine. <laughs> This is for Peter. How stuffy did it get in the like, stuff of thing? Well, it wasn't really how stuffy it was. It was um, it was how uncomfortable it was on the shoulders, because you got that little fake chainmail stuff on your shoulders, and then you got sixty pounds sitting on top of it. So when you took it off, you had these this little design embedded into your skin. Um, the most uncomfortable things about it were uh, the sight lines. It was really difficult to see anything below straight out. I could, I, there was a little crack in it that I could see straight out, but I couldn't see down and I couldn't see up. Uh, and um, so someone had to be at my feet when I was leaving set in order to make sure I didn't step off a, you know, a, a, a ramp or anything like that. Um, and the mechanical one opened and closed within millimeters of the tip of my nose. So if you go back and rewatch, be aware that every time I deliver my line, you'll see my head slightly tip back <laughs> in order for it to shoom, shoom. Thank you. Everything Thank you. you say just sounds like a song. Yeah. Shoom, huh? shoom. No, it just sounds like a reggae song. Whenever he just speaks, <laughs> it's just like, uh, I, I, I'm sitting here and I start, you know? Yes, you know, yeah, man, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I read <laughs> It's a similar vibe for island people, you know. These are island people we're looking at. These guys get it. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, good morning, and uh, good morning. thank you so much for your efforts in ruling the galaxy. You're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> uh, thank you. We've had to leave the kids in charge for the weekend, though, so, you know. <laughs> there are certain areas that need to be brought under control, though, certain places. Well, that's to be expected. I mean, you know, humans will be humans. Naughty children. Uh, my question to you is, uh, before preparing for your individual roles, did you um, read up much on the mythology of your individual gods, or did you just kind of decide to just play it straight? <laughs> I actually looked up Nirti after playing her. <laughs> but I actually really do, I love Egyptian mythology, so it's fascinating to me. And I didn't realize, I, I did, I, I guess I did look up actually, because I did find out she, she was evil and she had kind of played a role throughout history in Egypt. So, yeah, I guess I did. I looked mine up after the role as well. I had no idea. And then went to Egypt and she's everywhere. I was like, oh my God, Hathor was like, she's a big deal. She's kind of second in command to Isis. Um, is, is that right? Yes, Isis. Not that Isis. <laughs> I had to do some research before, because my, my Apophis showed up in the pilot, so there was definite research there. And I needed to come to grips with the, the whole Ra situation, because before Apophis it was just Ra. And in Egyptian mythology, Ra and Apophis are brothers, or at least um, combatants. And Ra would rule the day, and Apophis was the serpent god of the night and they would enjoy in battle overnight, every night. Ra would always win, therefore the sun would always rise. And it was um, part of the whole mythology of, uh, of the 24-hour cycle in um, Egyptian mythology. Plus, Apophis was not always known as Apophis. He's otherwise known as Apep, A-P-E-P. -E and um, uh, much to my chagrin, you know, it was something that needed to be explained at certain points. Um, but now you know, you'll never ask me that question again. <laughs> yeah, I, the, before I, I went on set, they gave me a little bit about Baal, and then uh, I researched a little bit more, and it was just amazing. I mean, Baal was just the 
god of everything everything there was so much you know um and recently actually somebody tweeted to me they've just discovered a house of Val. it's something that they've unearthed um so i kind of looked through all these gods and ah thank you so much that was very interesting yeah house of Val. um I kind of looked through all these gods and here's this storm god and that and then I found god of fertility. And I thought, that's what I'm going to use. <laughs> so that's what I kept in my head. Okay, Baal is the god of fertility. And that's what I went with. I like being the goddess of sex, drugs and rock and roll, it has to be said. <laughs> so would you have played your gods differently if looking back and going, oh, that, this is quite different than what I am? Well, well, sounds you know, like Susie and the Banshees here would have. <laughs> Really, as an actor, when you're when you're looking at your role, I mean, it, it may or may not be based on an Egyptian god, but you're looking at what your objective is, and whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, you then have to come up with some tactics, or they're going to be spontaneous. But if you're going to prepare well in advance, then you're going to come up with some tactics to achieve your goal, and it's going to be life and death, and you're not gonna, you're not going to stop at anything to get there. So in good writing, all of that stuff just is like falling off a log. You can just find your way. And sometimes if there are pieces missing in the writing, the actor provides it. So that's more the uh, preparation that, uh, that I do. And, and most actors probably would say, say the same thing. Also, I was, after reading about her, um, with the exception that Hathor in Egyptian mythology is not evil, uh, and obviously was in Stargate, but I, almost everything was identical. So one of the, conscious decisions I made at the audition was that this is a woman who used